Um, hey, hey, Adventure Girls. It's uh, Senka here, creator of Adventure Girls, funnily enough, and of course, uh, why, the Why She Adventures uh, conversation series. And if you have been following the lead up to this interview, you would have heard me fully like, oh, I got this lady to come and talk. And you'll be um, as excited as I am to hear her um, whole journey about why she adventures. Um, like I have said in all my other stuff, she was um, her book and another book were the two books I read back to back and were the reason that I packed up my life sold two thirds of my stuff and traveled uh, New Zealand for, th for five months out of the back of Hank the Tank. So I'm super excited to be sitting here having a juicy conversation about all the reasons why she adventures. So let me introduce to you, Miriam Lantois. Hey, Miriam. Hi, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> oh man, it's, it's like all my pleasure legitimately. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Thanks for coming along and sharing your story. So. Um, yeah, like as you would have heard in the intro, it's like I have just been raving about this interview. So I'm super excited to share your story. So here's a little something I prepared earlier. I just happened to have uh, Miriam's book here because I wanted to show you ladies how well read this book is. So it's been read. Yeah, it's amazing. Times. Yeah, because yeah. it's just such an inspiring book. So um, yeah, just about her stories and stuff. So now you get to hear how that all came about. For Miriam because it's like it's a really interesting starting point of like what you guys were doing beforehand to then go oh hey I'm just gonna pack up my life and go and live in the bush of New Zealand for seven-ish years. Yeah indeed um yeah it wasn't like okay from now on we're gonna we're gonna live for 10 years in the wilderness it wasn't like that uh we thought actually let's just do four seasons we just start with four seasons and I have no plan after that at all. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, that's what we did. But uh, it goes, the, the real things go a little bit further back. Um, let's start with meeting Peter. So I was traveling on my own in India, and uh, there I met Peter, who is from New Zealand. And he was looking for somebody to climb the Himalaya with, and I was as well. So we're very happy to meet each other. And um, we also immediately loved each other. In fact, I moved in with him the very next day. <laughs> so uh, it was all very quick. Um, but he had given up his position as university lecturer in Palmerston North um, five years prior at him. And he wanted to live uh, like a nomad, really, in India, just traveling around. And he had sold all his belongings and he had sold his house and he went with one little backpack to live in India. And so that story was like, wow, I never heard anything like that. And for me, he was like the embodiment, the personification of adventure. So if you ask where did it all start, it definitely started with him. So quick, just to interrupt there just before you carry on. So then like, so then I'm intrigued to go, Two things. How did you end up in India? And yeah. like, did you have the same goal and vision to be a bit of a nomad before that? Or was it meeting him that inspired you to go to rethink how life was for you? Yeah, um, I ended up in India because I was traveling there. You know, many people are traveling in India, don't they? Um, I had studied physical education in Holland. And directly after my study, I wanted to travel some. And I went to Africa and I uh, worked actually as a volunteer, volunteering as a teacher in Zimbabwe in the time of Mugabe. I actually met him. He opened some um, a sports festival uh, because he recently died. Um, so that's why I think. But anyway, uh, I worked there for a year. And after that, I thought I'm going to a bit more peaceful country and a bit more safe country. And my sister had just been in India. And she said, it's really cheap to travel around. It's really <laughs> you just go into a bus. You don't need to book anything. And you go to a hotel. You just sleep there for one euro and go to a um, restaurant and eat there for 50 cents. Or, you know? So that sounded very attractive. And that's why I went there. And after five months traveling on my own, uh, I met Peter. But at the time, I thought, okay, I'm going to travel for some years, maybe after that I need to settle down 
have a job, um, probably have children, and um, yeah, just that's what's uh, logical in life, right? Then I met Peter, and he said, no, if you are very clever, you can actually live without working. And I thought, well, I've never heard that before. It sounds reasonable. <laughs> I, <heard> it before. <laughs> I love it. it sounds sounds genius. <laughs> yeah. Well, not sort of rocket science, but uh, I just had never thought about it. And um, yeah, so his ideas influenced me majorly. And he said, well, let's see how long we can postpone not working and just keep on traveling. As long as we keep our costs down, we will um, continue this way. So that's what we did. So I needed to work for one year in New Zealand to get my residency. And that's my one and only year. <laughs> so that's when the book starts with me giving up my job and, um, and um, giving up our cottage that we were renting. But if you see the whole story, you see we never really owned that much. And uh, we only had a few belongings anyway. So giving up was relatively easy for us. So it was only one year for me anyway. Yeah. Wow. What a fascinating story. It's so nice to actually hear the background background to all of yeah. that. Because it's, you know, I guess the book gives us a little bit of that. And then, you know, and then it really starts from uh, to talk about the journey that you took, like your preparation leading up to. Yeah. Uh, heading away and, and doing that because I guess there's got to be a real contrast to um, having lived or travelled uh, through India uh, because it's still yeah. fairly, you know, there's shops and all of that. But doing that versus not working but living in the wilderness, that's a whole different game, right? Yeah, and indeed. Also in India, so overpopulated. Mm. No. Um, so uh, there's always people and it's also handy because there is so many uh, choice shops and little restaurants so you don't need to plan much ahead you know, very different in New Zealand yeah. what a kind like you actually couldn't get any more co any more of a contrast right volume yeah, no. accessibility uh, just busyness to the wilderness of New Zealand where it would be I don't know do you even know what your longest day was longest period that you went without seeing people, other people? Well, a few weeks or so, yeah, yeah. Say two or three weeks. Wow, <laughs> that's a huge contrast. So yeah. what, uh, so what? Oh, was... maybe even longer, maybe five weeks in that uh, wet spring that was so raining, raining, raining. In the end, I was sort of hoping that someone would go, come to the Mataki Taki. Is that the, the little hut by the, um, by the beach or near a beach or something like that? Or was that a different one? Uh, when I was raining for three weeks, we were stuck in Downey's hut in the Matakitaki, Nelson Lake area. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Was no wonder no one was there. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Noted. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So um, when you finally, just like you guys decided, that's it, we're off, we're packing up our lives. Um, I like to say, I guess the great thing is you didn't have a whole lot of positions, but it would have had, you still would have had to have rethought how you were going to do things. So like, what was going through your head when you were like, okay, we're, we're packed up, our stuff is gone, you know, that life is, that chapter is closed, and now it's off to go live in the wilderness, here's our whatever, packs and food, like, what was that like going, by this life and hello completely unknown um yeah, it was very exciting because we've been preparing for a long time um we were preparing for what sort of food do we have to take mm. so just to clarify we had the plan to um to go out for four months so for four months we need to get food into the bush um and we put all these things in buckets in plastic buckets with lids and we put those buckets in the ground. And we thought we're just going to dig in the ground and um, dig them in so the rats wouldn't get at it, you see. And so we got there with our shovels and you can't. can't just dig in the ground. It's all roots and stones. We was like, oh, what do we do now? Um, and then we thought, okay, we have no choice. We just have to find a natural dip and then put stones in there around it. So anyway, we were um, preparing for food. We were preparing for clothing. And I have made all these uh, woolen clothing, uh, woolen trousers and that, 
um, from blankets that I found in the op shop. And um, one of that was where sort of a ski trousers that comes up to your chest. I thought it was nice and warm for the kidneys. <laughs> and with those elastic goes to the top, you know what I mean? And um, that was really warm, but so impractical. Because every time you need to pee, you have to take your three jumpers off. <laughs> <laughs> and then where are you going to put those jumpers? In, in the snow, in the wet grass? That uh, not, wasn't handy at all. So uh, we learned uh, big time there. So we were very excited. We had been preparing for a year, basically, while I was working. And when it finally came, we were saying to each other, well, aren't we lucky that we're doing this? And we arrived in this beautiful spot in um, South Marlborough, that was. Beautiful spot. And uh, we pitched a tent and we made it all very comfortable and practical. And um, we said, this is fantastic. It's amazing that we're doing this. We're so excited. And then the next day, we thought, oh, oh what now? And there was absolutely nothing to do, you know. There was, um, I thought, well, we're all very well set up. We even had brought a bit of meat in there, so I didn't need to go hunting. And in fact, we had absolutely nothing to do. And of course, my mind had been much uh, sped up by um, working, close to interaction, all the excitement. And suddenly, it was like falling into a black hole because our mind was much faster than the rhythm of nature. And um, the mind had to slow down. And that takes about, I find out, um, about two weeks for the mind to slow down. Wow, that's quite a long period to be in a place of not a lot going on. Oh, uh, and in that time, you uh, experience boredom and restlessness. So in order for you to calm down completely, you have to go through a period of boredom. That's interesting, isn't it? There are all these things we didn't know. No one had told us this. Um, so now we know that if I don't experience boredom, my mind is not slowing down. If I amuse myself with um, all sort of entertainment, my mind is not slowing down. Just keep in the same old mind. As well as I realized that a lot of people only go on holiday for two weeks. And after two weeks, they go home. So mm -hmm. it just didn't get the the benefit of the the slowdown of the mind because once the once you get into the rhythm of nature it's amazing you can just sit for an hour so just sit in the sun and look at the beauty around you you know what the, they call the sort of meditative state yeah i love that description of um the rhythm of nature like you've said it a couple of times in there and it just like it automatically feels really peaceful so yeah. like you can kind of feel like it would just really resonate with your like right in your soul because you would just be um instead of trying to be anywhere or do anything or you know having to solve problems or whatever that you can just be fully present and immersed in everything that's going on around you yeah yeah indeed. yeah it takes a little a uh, little bit of perseverance you have to go through as i said this morning yeah it's not easy I wonder if that would be, um, it must be really confrontational in some ways, like going through that shift of like, if you're not occupied and busy and having not experienced boredom to that, like two weeks, like yeah. what goes, what goes, what went on for you in that period of time? Like to like, yeah, how did, how did you, how did you deal with that? And, and I guess more so now, do you find that you are able to uh, adapt to the rhythm of nature more quickly because you know? Yeah, it's very good to know that this is a natural process. Yeah. It amazes me how quickly the mind speeds up and how slowly it slows down. Like it could take only one day to speed up to get into this, the city rhythm, you know? And technology speeds it up even faster. So if you go with your devices into the wilderness, I doubt if you ever get to the rhythm of nature. But uh, yeah, the process, well, luckily I am with Peter. He is much older than I am and he's got a lot more experience. He lived in India where you can do very easily, very little. And he said you have to learn the art of doing nothing, which is a very good uh, skill to have because sometime in your life, you have to, uh, you can't do anything. You have to slow down when you're injured or when you're sick or when you're very old. 
and he thought it was a good skill to have. <laughs> I, uh, in the first day, I was running around and doing all these things, um, organizing the camp and making everything practical and that. And then Peter kept saying, well, you know, slow down, just sit down and just sit in the sun. And, um, well, yeah, it, was, it wasn't easy, I must say. And also, we left civilization behind, and with it, it felt we left time behind. Mm. In a sense that we always sort of know what we're going to do next, right? We have a planning of Monday we're going to do this, Tuesday that. Uh, in October, November, I'm going to do this and all that. So we didn't have any of that. Not deliberately, we didn't even bring a clock, a watch. So um, we left time behind and with it felt like we had this wide, big wall of future. And somehow it felt very, um, a little bit um, uneasy to have such a sort of a white sheet in front of us. It's strange why that should feel uneasy, but maybe just because it's different. Yeah, and especially I guess if it's something new as well, to have that expansive feeling of, uh, yeah. nowhere to be uh, at a certain time. Yeah, yeah, indeed. We set it up that way. We didn't want to have a future. We want to have no plans and absolutely nothing ahead of us and go completely white. Uh, That's amazing. So what, that great. Yeah. So what made you decide to then, like, do something different? Like, you, like, you know, this way you went to this, you went to your first camp and yeah. you settled into your, after your two weeks, into the um, rhythm of nature then it's like, so what became your daily life and went, like, what called you to change that? So like if you're at one campsite, what makes you go, we've spent enough time here, be it no idea of what the time length may be, it's time yeah. to move on to somewhere else or move to a new place. Or what drove that, was that ex the, the desire to explore other areas nearby? Yeah, yeah, that also. Um, but we set off to live off hunting and gathering, but we also had supplies. And we found out how difficult it would have been without those supplies. Uh, quite frighteningly so. <laughs> so we're heavily dependent on our um, uh, um, rice and flour. And when that was finished, we had to go out. We had to go out back to town. So we had four months to start with. Um, so after that, we had to go out and uh, find another place. But within those four months, we also had different camp, uh, camp spots. Yeah, we wanted to look up another valley. Yeah, and we ended up in one valley that was not quite north facing and was really cold. And that's what we learned also, that uh, north facing valleys is so much warmer. It's like the difference between winter and summer. Wow, that's incredible. And it's so funny because I think you can research the shit out of stuff, like, you know, look it yeah. up, figure it out, plan it out in your head. But the actual application of things, when you go to do something like that, that you're just like, how did I not even think that a north facing valley would be warmer or that there would be that much contrast in it? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Was is um, majorly different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Was there something that you were like that was completely unexpected that you were like just didn't even plan for, and you were like, how did how did we not factor that thing into going and living, you know, in the wilderness? Yeah, in the um, in the summer we thought the first summer. So we set out in autumn. It's just because I had to work for a year, and so I could get away and in autumn. It was a little bit funny. It would have been a lot easier had we gone out in the summer. But we thought when the summer came, we thought this is going to be easy because it's going to be really warm. <laughs> but as often happens in like December, around Christmas time, you get big floods, right? Mm. Those northerlies come from the north uh, and bring a huge amount of water. That's why you get all those floods. Anyway, we were on top of the mountain and... Um, because we thought it was so warm, we can stay on top of the mountains. Because if we are in the valley, um, with the smoke, we'll chase away all the goats and deer. That's why we were on top of the mountain. Um, anyway, uh, what was I going to tell? Oh, yeah, we're sitting there in the rain. And we thought, why the heck didn't we bring a tarpaulin? 
like a big tarpaulin. Uh, it's not that heavy, like a five by five meter tarpaulin. We would have been so much drier. We had a smaller tarpaulin for the wood, and sometimes we were sitting on top of the wood. Uh, but yeah, some of those easy, easy things would have made our life so much better. <laughs> the power of hindsight, right? Yeah. <laughs> And it's not like you can just go pop down to a Bunnings and go and get one from where you are as well. No, no, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, so once yeah. we're in the mountains, yeah, that yeah. particular spot was four days' walk from the nearest road. Wow. So that was very far. And then that's just uh, a yeah. road. Then I, how yeah. much, and then there'll be a distance to get to a township, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So we be really careful with what to take. Mm. So, um, yeah, to think things over quite a lot. It's also a disaster if you lose something like a spoon. A spoon is not expensive, but it's a disaster if you lose one, right? So all these things and all these items get a different value, not in money, mm. how much you use them, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> how much more convenient they make your life in a place like yeah, they, this. Wow, it's amazing. Yeah. Who would ever thought that a spoon would, be, would hold so much value? Yeah, and people say, well... You know, you can cut a spoon from wood and all that, but it's not so nice eating, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a friend, she does bushcraft and she does carving, and they're yeah. always really thick. <laughs> yeah, whoever eats from the spoon, he been carving himself. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so, uh, so how long did you actually end up in totality like living in the wilderness then my understanding was like seven years but you said 10 and I was like that's just yeah, seven years yeah seven years in New Zealand and New Zealand. Then after seven years so in 2017 we left the book came out yes and escaped all the media because there was a lot of media attention around it and we went to Europe and we lived there in nature I can't say it's wilderness because um it's not really wilderness in Europe <laughs> Not like New Zealand. Roads, no, too many roads and houses, and mm. we can walks and away from one house. And you said, shall we go a little bit further? And then we already saw the next farmhouse. So Europe doesn't have wilderness, but beautiful nature, and especially in Germany, southern Germany, mm. amazing mountains, and some of it looks very much like New Zealand. It's amazing in Bavaria. Wow. From thousand kilometers over the e4 walkway from france into switzerland into austria into germany then it was september and already freezing cold september should be nice summery weather still but yeah. no, it was autumn and the leaves already came down and became yellow and we thought oh my god we're not going to walk further because our idea was to walk from france to istanbul wow <laughs> Uh, but we knew already it would be way too far on the walk through winter. But I think it's sometimes it's good to have like ridiculous goals mm. and uh, to just set off and say, I'm going to walk to Istanbul. Also, sounds very cool. <laughs> People say, Where are you walking to? You can say, You're going to walk to Istanbul. And they praise you. That is really funny. They praise you as though you've already done it. <laughs> <laughs> we are only done one month, you know, we're only in France. But, um, yeah, so the idea was to go to Istanbul, but we took a bus all the way to Bulgaria from um, Germany. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we cut a, a huge, we got a huge bit. And continued walking in Bulgaria and in Turkey. So we did go to Istanbul. And uh, we walked the Likia Way, the Lycian Way. That's 500 kilometers in the south of Turkey. It's also beautiful. Wow. That's, I'm like, I feel like I just want to be writing all these places down. It sounds amazing. Oh yeah, well, they're very easy to find and uh, they're quite popular and you can just find them on the internet. Just follow that. The difference was we did the Lycian Way in winter and other people do that in summer. So it's very busy, but we saw hardly anyone because it was raining all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you... Um, how did you cope with all the seasonal changes then? Like even, you know, back here in New Zealand and stuff like that, were you able to, like when you, when you left the wilderness to get, go back to civilization to get, you know, maybe your food store and stuff like that back up, did you 
need to get anything else or did you just did you actually just have everything with you and it's like if it gets any colder you just have to come up with another solution out in the wilderness yeah well we started off in autumn so um we had lots and lots of warm clothes in my uh, fancy uh, <laughs> <laughs> make from that blanket from the <laughs> off shop. I was just thinking, uh, like, as you talk about just like having to go for a wee in the bush and just having to peel all yeah. those layers off, and it's just bad enough when you go like high yeah. stuff like that. You've got to get your pack off and all of that. But yeah, indeed, that no, was disastrous. Yeah. So I wore that maybe twice, and then <laughs> I, um, I put that away, chucked it away. I think. Uh, so never, um, took that again but New Zealand is so changeable weather wise mm. you may as well have exactly the same clothes in winter as in summer <laughs> uh, especially in the mountains it's so um, yeah. cold often right yeah so, no, yeah we had just uh, and with those same clothes who went to Europe and did the same thing wow so did you change much of your pack between or your gear, I want to say pack because I imagine that you're just carrying a pack with all your stuff in it. Yeah, I used to have a 85 litre pack in New, in New Zealand and then I got a 100 litre pack and that was way better. So uh, that pack is fantastic. How heavy is a 100 litre pack then? Well, it depends what you put in it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not 100 kilo. No. Um, no, average, when it's all filled be? up, it, I, yeah, it would be easily 25 kilos. Wow. So you're, not, you know, you're carrying that around on every, you know, not everywhere you go because you set up camp and stuff like that, but that's yeah. your life, 25 kgs worth of your life in a pack. That's amazing. Yeah. I struggled to get, I struggled to get things into two drawers and a truck and a rooftop box, and I still had stuff in storage. So, yeah. I, but I bet you don't need it, though. No. <laughs> it was and it was surprising how much I didn't need things. There was exactly. just, I packed a bunch of in cases, just in case, just in case, and then it became better at just using things a little bit more, um, you know, over again, so that I didn't have to, to. To what's the word I'm trying to say? Everything became multifunctional. That's what I'm trying to say. It's like. Yeah. I could wear it for this, this, or this, instead of, oh, I need a top for that and a top for that. It's like, oh, that one top, so there's all three. Okay, I don't need that stuff. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, I've got as a rule that if it's really cold, I'll, pull, I'll put all my clothes on, all my clothes on. Yeah. So I've got like five layers or so. But if there's something left, it's obviously useless. <laughs> because you can't put it on anymore, right? I've got already five layers. Did that take time to refine that down that flight, that knowing that this is what I need to take? Did you start out no, before, and then over the years actually just go, don't need it, don't need it, don't need it? Yeah, yeah, indeed. We used to have a um, oil skin body warmer. You know those oil skins? Yeah, the real heavy. Yeah, but just a body warmer, so without sleeves. Oh, um, yeah. And we really loved it, but it's more like symbolic, like this is like an old... Yeah, this is what they had when the horse and cart time. <laughs> um, and it's quite heavy, so we, we chuck that out. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Um, of all of the places in, in the seven years of living in the wilderness in New Zealand, what would be your top three places that you're like, they will forever be etched as a memory, you know, like they were just breathtaking and beautiful, or they were like, super challenging and like what a place like I don't think I'll go there again <laughs> like <laughs> glad I did it and I experienced it like what would you you know what are your the, those when I say that what are the three places that popped your mind um I think well everything with us is really for a practical reason so um if I see a picture now of a forest that is really beautiful in my eyes say when I saw that picture 10 years ago, uh, I would have loved that picture of lots of moss and a lot of green and all that. No, if I see this picture, I think, wow, that looks really wet. It looks actually awful because where are we going to camp? I don't see many open spots. Um, it's going to be really rainy perhaps. 
because of all the moss on the side of the trees and all those sort of things. So our eyes is, are really geared towards practicality. Mm. Um, the mm. best thing is goats for me. So wherever there is goats, I'm happy. So uh, West Coast is perfect. Mm. Very wet, of course, in West Coast. But um, there are some dry places in the Peperoas. So that's northern West Coast. Um, with a lot of limestone. And I love limestone because that's often drier. And on the side of those cliffs, you often can find a little dry spot where the water doesn't come in like a shelter. Yeah. And that's exactly the places where the goats like to go as well. Because, of course, you yeah. led to, uh, just to sort of jump off the topic of the three places that popped to mind, because you uh, were vegetarian before you set out and then you had to learn to hunt because, I guess, yeah. you, know, you, you can't carry all your food all of the time. So how was no, that? Um, so years and years ago, when we first arrived in New Zealand, I saw this young guy with a bow and arrow in the forest and he had just come back and had shot nothing as the case with um, bow hunters. Um, but I was really inspired by seeing that guy and so alien. The last time I saw bows and arrows, that was like Robin Hood when I was reading the stories back in Holland. So then I started to think, I would really like to learn how to shoot the bow and arrow. Then we had the plan to live in the wilderness. And I said, well, I'd like to then um, provide the meat. And, um, well, I realized that to give up being vegetarian. But I didn't think so much. And a lot of vegetarians are actually thinking the same, that they would eat meat if it was wild. And, you know, animal lives in happy life until it gets shot. <laughs> <laughs> Different <laughs> from uh, factory. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, it was very difficult for me because, uh, as I said in the movie, it's nothing like a carrot. <laughs> 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 Meat feels very strange if you're not used to it. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's very satisfying to work so hard. And it took me about six months before I successfully shot my first goat. So it was so much work. And to finally get one and then bring back to camp and see Peter's face being so happy and proud uh, is absolutely amazing feeling. Wow. That's phenomenal. Yeah, was with a, that was with a bow, was it? Not a shotgun? Yeah. Not a gun? Not a shotgun, but a, uh, a gun. <laughs> with a bow, yeah. I wow. started off with a bow and I hunted with a bow for two years. Yeah. I realized, and this is another realization, <laughs> that um, it's quite cruel, actually to shoot an arrow because an animal doesn't die immediately and it's often wounded. And then I have to track it down and follow the bits and pieces of uh, blood and animal and then hopefully find it. But sometimes I would fail and I knew that the animal would suffer for days before it would die with my arrow in its, in its body, you know. Uh, secondly, it's very expensive. Every arrow is $15. And if you shoot an arrow and you miss the rabbit, say, because the rabbit's quite small, <laughs> if you miss it and it hits the rocks, then the arrow bends a little bit and then it doesn't shoot straight anymore. So um, it becomes a very expensive little goat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one time I shot six arrows and one goat and still ran away. And I thought, well, this is, you know, cruel and expensive. So after two years, I was introduced by a friend called Daniel um, to rifles. And then it was so easy. I was used to stalking, coming very close to the animal. And the uh, animal died straight away, one bullet, bang. Uh, that's amazing, just that, like... <laughs> 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 was there... Yep. A, diff a whole different sort of sense of like not I don't want to use the word satisfaction um but yeah because you develop those skills with the bow and arrow and then to quickly transfer yeah. it over to shooting yeah it's, it's I was uh, really aware that the, the machine was doing the job um but at least I got some animals and at least they were not suffering much more humane so yeah um, I must say with the bow and arrow is much more satisfying 
but um, I'm very glad now to hunt with a rifle. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. All right, I, I just couldn't resist asking into that space. So going back to your three places, so the, um, was it uh, Piparoa, you were saying, around those areas, West Coast? Oh, yeah, that's for goat regions. Yep, yep. so for the goats. Mm -hmm. Number one. Weather regions, um, yeah. we would avoid the West Coast very much, generally. And we would go in the area around Twizel. And so beautiful there. Yes. Hopkins, the Huxley, the Ahuriri, Ahuriri are really beautiful because it's mm. a forest, beautiful glaciated river valleys. Um, yeah, good climate, nice and frosty in, in, um, in autumn, quite cold in winter. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's such a beautiful area. We were just talking, I think, before we started recording um, about the Lake Ohau area and things like that. that there's a common yeah. area there. We were just talking about Monument Hut of, of were driven out to there. But uh, you met, did you walk? Did you walk out that way, or I assume you would have walked? Yeah, we walked many times, and we lived there in our truck here. We lived there for three months. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, it was fantastic. And the Dingle, just the one over as well. But it's getting more and more popular because those people from Wanaka and Twizel. <laughs> They're yeah. finding all the good spots. <laughs> yeah, indeed. In terms of remoteness, when there's no one there, but also plenty of hares, are the ear mountains. Ah, where about today? Some people say that's in Southland. Wow. And, and the people are quite relaxed and uh, there's not so many regulations. And you can just camp much easier in that. Yeah, so uh, that also feels different. There's no uh, restrictions, those sort of things. Yeah. Also good. Did you do much of the North Island in your living in the wilderness or were you mostly kicking around the South Island? Yeah, mostly kicking in the South Island. <laughs> Except for the Tiaroa. So in our last year, we walked mm. the Tiaroa Trail, starting in the top of the north, all the way to Bluff. And of course, then we walked through uh, the North Island. Yes. And like that area, also west coast, north of New Plymouth. Oh, we did some deviation. So we didn't follow the road. Uh, Peter knows quite a lot of the country. And he said, oh, let's go just here. So again, we found our delicious goats on the west coast, north of New Plymouth. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I think there's uh, probably a few Kiwi women and any international women that would love to do the Tearo track. Like they've got yep. this. On it's becoming list. very popular. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Did you, um, how long did you guys take to walk the trip? Like, did you do the full track as in there were a few deviations, but did you go, we're going to start at Northland and we're going to finish right Yeah, it took us 10 months. Wow. <laughs> and this is about three times as much as uh, the normal people. So we're going very, very slow. Uh, other people do this in four or five months. Yeah, but you didn't, you'd, I guess you didn't have a need to be anywhere. So no. may as well enjoy yeah, the journey. Good. <laughs> yeah, uh, we had no time restrictions, no visa restrictions, uh, nothing at all. So we thought we'd take our time. And so whenever I shot an animal like a turkey in Northland or get a possum or a goat or animal, um, we rest, could rest. So we find our spot next to the river and we sit there for a week and eat our animal. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> And this is so good because, oh yeah, we saw those Tiararoa walkers near Mavora Lakes where we were camping at the time. And all of them look really um, malnourished. They looked really totally skinny. Thought, okay, we're going to do the same, but we're going to be fit at the end of it, not malnourished. And I'm, because I'm much younger than Peter, I can afford, you know, running myself down. But at his age... Um, he could not, because that would have really long-term consequences. So he started walking the Tiararoa Trail when he was 59, I think. So it's quite old. You don't meet many people over. No. So um, one downfall is that I have to carry a bit more weight, because he really feels it if he has to carry more than 50, 15 kilos. Hmm. Everything over 15 goes in my pack. <laughs> so that's why our pack is so heavy <laughs> and that is why you are so fit <laughs> yeah yeah so it's a win-win situation <laughs> <laughs> i love it that's awesome <laughs> yeah oh my goodness because it slows me down 
and um, so Peter can keep up with me. So we're completely equal if I'm burdened down with weight. Yeah. And um, so comparing the North and the South Island together, like what was some of the things that you loved about either of, of the other islands compared to the other? Well, us being living in the bush for so long, we never really see many Maori people. And when we walked in Northland, uh, we met a few and they said, ah, oh, come, come inside and, you know, spend some, that even we stay in their houses. And uh, that was really interesting because, first of all, um, when we met uh, somebody, really nice man, um, he straight away started talking about his aunties and his nephews and I thought, is this a joke? <laughs> really in detail and I realized that it's so a family is so important mm. to them and then he's talking about my people this and my people that and he said what about your people and I thought my people much people <laughs> and he said yeah you're talking about your people and then suddenly I had to think about my people and where they come from and then I said oh, I yeah. am actually I come from Holland in this three big rivers coming out of the mountains from uh, Germany and France. And with that came all the silt, the river silt. So it's super fertile in Holland. And it's only a very small country. And it can provide plenty and plenty of food because it's all fertile on ground. And that's why it's so overpopulated. So I was telling this story suddenly to him because he asked me about my people. So that was great also to do some reflection about uh, my background. Uh, so that was really good. Um, there are some really wild places in, in the North Island also. But we didn't really like to come back to the South Island and have that remoteness again. Yeah. Yeah. There's such a contrast to two different islands. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so who have been some influential women in your life um, maybe around that? The, in the adventuring space or the outdoor space for you? Um, well, my mum, of course, she's very adventurous and she always liked to go traveling and um, she's very strong physically as well. And uh, she always took us, oh, she took us on a little trips. I remember that she took one of us. So I've got two sisters and then once a year, I think it was, but for my feeling, it was much more often. She took one of us out of school. And then we were allowed to go for a two-day walk, which felt endless. And we had a little cart, and she put all our stuff in the cart. And we just walked to a campground, and spent the night there, and the next day we walked back. And that was such an experience for me. It was like, wow, it was an expedition, you know? So anyway, she did all that. And she was always encouraging. For instance, um, my sister and I, we wanted to go traveling through Ireland. And we're saying, oh, shall we, how shall we travel with buses or shall we go hitchhiking? And then my mother said, oh, of course you go hitchhiking. You're at the right age to go hitchhiking. <laughs> Surely you go hitching. So um, she encourages to, to do all these things and to take the risk and, um, yeah, see anyone. Anyway. That's amazing. I love it. I love that influence of our parents and stuff like that, how they just kind of, help shape us and things like I always remember we did we uh, went camping in caravans from yeah. a young young age so I just remember our summer holidays being you know seven eight nine like just running around and maybe jandals if you were lucky but you'd just be yeah. running around in like maybe a bikini and you know a t-shirt and I'd be yeah. like bye mom I'm off to go and you'd go explore and you'd go um, go through the forest and and out to the beach and and back then no one cared it was just like as in we'll just see you for lunch and that's how I remember hot, like hot summer holidays just that exploring that freedom that just like that ability to just go and discover and get lost in whatever it is that you're doing so yeah. I know that that has definitely played a role in my now as an adult I just cannot get enough of just going and finding a place on a map and going for a wander, like no matter, like no pace and necessary sometimes and just kind of exploring it and seeing what's around and that sort of stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. I think parents should indeed uh, encourage that. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah. I actually interviewed two amazing um, women um, that uh, one, she talks about motherhood and mountain biking. So her passion's all about mountain biking. She's a mum as well. So just how she's getting her kids and um, out to be active and all that sort of stuff. And then um, Michelle, who's got outdoorsy mama, she's um, just all about, talks so much about just taking bit, little bits of adventure and outdoors and all of that into kids' everyday life that um, is just so inspiring that it was like, like, why would you not do that? Because yeah. like, I'm sure we'd be setting them up for a much better future to go. She's like, you know, you just leave 20 minutes before you need to be somewhere and find a park on the way and just go and eat your snack there. And it's like, it's such a genius idea on a way to get, you know, everyday adventure into everybody's lives. So Yeah, nice. Yeah, that brings us to the topic of adventure, I think. Uh, an adventure has to have some sort of danger in it. Because <laughs> I love otherwise it. it wouldn't be adventure, right? If there's no danger at all, well, it's just a trip. It's just a walk on the park or something. Yeah, so there's a, the consequence is a little bit of danger there. But, uh, of course, it doesn't have to be over the top. But it's something that's a little bit scared and you do it anyway. Right? Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. So what's one message then um, that you have for all the women who want to have more fun and adventure in their lives and they're maybe a little bit afraid of like taking a step to go and do the thing that they've always wanted to do, whether it's packing up their lives and going and living in trucks or in the wilderness or just getting out and having more adventure and fun in their lives. Yeah, first I think you have to realise that you only got one life. So if you don't do it, you know, your life is going past and one day you'll die and think, oops, this is it. So um, you don't want to really die with regrets. I think it's very important. And um, to realize that, you then got to think of how would you then want to make a change to your life? And of course, everyone is afraid. Everyone, um, no one is um, really happy to, um, to go into the unknown. But... Yeah, Peter and I, um, we, we do it anyway. So we feel the fear and do it anyway. Mm. So it's, I got Peter and he got me. So I would say if you don't dare to go alone, which I understand completely, then maybe find a companion. And then people say, well, I can't find one. And I can't live with that person or that person. Well, then the next question is, is why can't you live with another person? Because actually, that is very difficult. I always say the ego cannot live with or without another person. It is very difficult uh, because it's very confronting and um, it's like a mirror, um, the other person, right? <laughs> and insulted and you fight or, and argue. Um, but that's all the most difficult thing is to live with another person. But if you can overcome that obstacle, then you can do a lot of things. So uh, I think they go hand in hand. That's amazing. It is, it is actually quite, fan, quite fascinating how being in a relationship with someone can create so many triggers because, like you say, there's, it's like mirrors. There's nowhere to hide in a relationship. Uh, so it's like you, there's always triggers coming up. And through that, though, I guess, is where all the growth and the goodness and all that comes from and expanding yourself. Um, and who you are and who you know yourself to be as well. So you get to challenge yourself uh, through the, like through doing adventure to discover more of who you are and the depths of who you are. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but every adventure that you survive because of this danger of all, so you've survived the danger, I think you grow more confident and mm. you go stronger in a way, right? Yeah. But yeah, to talk about relationships, often... If Peter says something to me that's totally ridiculous, I just laugh. This is no, right? It's not right. But if he says something that is a little bit true, I get upset. Oh, he shouldn't be saying that. And then I think, well, should he not be saying the truth then? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I try to listen to him, especially when it is about the truth. And, um, yeah, trying to learn from it. But we are quite good at talking about these things like conditioning because a lot of stuff that you're doing is because you're trained to react that way. 
trained to um, burst into tears whenever there is anger or, <laughs> or get angry at things. So, um, yeah, there's so much programming. So if you can talk about it quite in a distance, like, oh, this is my programming, it's a little bit easier. So you don't have to take it so personal. Mm. It's that dissociation from all the emotion of what's going on and just the ability to step back and kind of go, that's your record that's playing. That's the one that's got those groups yep. that as the same thing that just keeps repeating itself and being able to take the needle off, maybe give it a little scratch and play a different tune or something like that. Yeah, indeed. But that's also one effect of living in the wilderness for so long is that I have seemed to become less sort of emotional and less sort of those triggers and less inward looking and more outward looking. And that's such a relief. It makes me a lot more happy. And a lot of these psychological, psychological problems have dissolved rather than being solved by thinking about it and analyzing it. Do you yeah, think some of interesting? Yeah. Do you think some of that is because of the, of being away from just being away from all that, a lot of external, let's call it stuff, city stuff, and being able to really get a little bit, um, not in your head while you're away and being uh, reflective, but to really just, I guess, have that space to ponder and uh, grow and reevaluate and assess, reassess life and what's important and kind of re have the opportunity to rewrite how you want to be. Yeah, indeed. I think to reflect on your character, you need time. Mm. Um, it's time to contemplate, to sit around underneath that tree with nothing to do. And then those things come up and you hear them. Mm. And you might think of, actually, I want to do that or this. You need some time for that. And now I think in modern world, uh, the time is lacking. Mm. That's, that's such an interesting thing. I just actually did a post about it just the other day that it's like in, that busy, in the busyness of everyday life, we can just forget what it's like to create space to allow things to kind of perturbate and percolate and like bubble around a bit because it, we have to be somewhere, we have to do something or we've got to, and I think that that's one thing that nature does for us, like being in the outdoors, there's just, there's no, there's no escaping it, you know, you're, there's oh. nothing that, sure, you can go for a walk and you can fix some things up and blah, 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 but at the end of the day, there's just this, it's such a, it's such a vast space to be in and it's so grounding and earthing that you can't help but um, create that space. And face it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I love it. I heard some um, people saying that when they first go into the bush, it didn't happen exactly to me so much, but they become very emotional, like crying a lot. <laughs> all those things come out, I guess. Yeah, and when you don't give yourself, like if, you've not, if you're not experienced and giving yourself the opportunity to kind of breathe and um, develop and all that sort of stuff in that space, it can be really confronting because there's, there's nothing to hide. There's nothing to hide behind again. No, no, yeah. it's nothing to hide. Oh. And it's very uh, confronting that way. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like, really, yeah. people say you, you um, find yourself in the wilderness, but it's because of this, this confronting that, yeah. Yeah, I love it. Because it's a dangerous thing, so suddenly you might freak out and then you think, oh, I'm not so brave after all, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the slightest thing. Oh, my goodness. It is what, that's why I, I just I love the outdoors and I love nature and, and everything that Mother Nature provides because it comes from the earth, it goes back to the earth, and it's like it's – one of the most grounding things and it's like especially when you're in the mountains because you know let's for the most part the mount, mountains don't move really you know they they got the mountain itself doesn't move so it's so grounding energetically and it's like you, you can't help but sit in that space and then feel into that and um and that in itself can be either really con confronting or really empowering to um, sit with nature and be with that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, I don't know if I would say I would love nature because it's uh, also so raw. <laughs> I was thinking today it's a little bit like uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like uh, Jimi Hendrix, Voodoo Child. <laughs> it's so raw, it's so sort of overwhelming that yes, you sort of respect it and admire it. And um, you know, it's really overwhelming at times. Yeah. But I, uh, I love walking in the park, you know, just nice and quiet. 
but um, the wilderness can be really rough. Um, extreme storms, thunder and lightning, and ice and snow and floods. Um, everything. That's amazing. That's so that yeah. I guess for us, you know, for us not non wilderness living people. Um, we're probably not as exposed to it, which would be such an amazing, that in itself, I think would be an amazing adventure. Yeah, because if you go out in the bush for a hike, you, of course, you pick your weather, you would be silly yeah. in, the, in the rain. <laughs> but yeah, we have to sit through all that and sit through all these storms and lightning. Yeah, it's really yeah. frightening. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Maria, it's, um, I was just going to say, it's like heaven and it's like hell at the same time. It's <laughs> tense. <laughs> I think that's the perfect note to wrap this up. I just want to say thank you so much. Like, um, it's been really great not just talking about like the places that you went to and all of that, but I love the conversation that we've just gone into at the end there because I just think that, um, and, you know, Mother Nature has just a way of bringing so much stuff to the surface that um, we can push down through the busyness of everyday life. So it's really nice to have an, ex an exploring conversation with you about you know, what that's done for you and just the space that it cre can create. So thank you so much for just yeah. all of that, like all of the discussion. I love it so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very broad. Yeah, thank you so much, Anne. That's awesome. And um, if people want to get a hold of you, because I know that, like, I'm going to do this as a plug because this book is freaking amazing and everyone knows um, that. But you also mentioned to me uh, that you have got another book that, in the wings. Yeah, so at the moment we're staying with a, in a friend's place because I'm now writing my second book. I don't know the title yet and I don't know when it will be published, but it will be published. Um, and that is about our travel in Europe and all what happened to us there in Australia and again here in New Zealand. Um, so yeah, but the first book, Woman in the Wilderness, is also being translated into Dutch, German, French and Chinese. And so many international listeners might want to send one home. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Ah, going to inspire so many more women out there to want to get out and do some, do some crazy stuff. So thank you so much for that. If anyone wanted to get a hold of you, Miriam, what's the best way they can do that? Um, the best and only way is actually via the website, miriamlanswood.com. And there's a contact form and that goes straight to my inbox. So uh, just by email. That's amazing. Miriam, thank you so much for um, helping uh, spread the love and the desire and the inspiration for getting more women out to do some cool shit out there. Yeah, it's well been my pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much.